Want help to grow your business? Download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today. Hi everybody, I'm Keith Abraham and welcome to Passionate People. In this episode, we're going to spend some time and talk about creating your personal life to-do list. I call it a life to-do list, not a bucket list. I love the movie with Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson in it called Bucket List, but I often think that, you know, a bucket list is that's when a doctor taps you on the shoulder and says, go and do everything you got to do before you kick the bucket. So I want this to be your life to-do list. What is it that you want to do in your lifetime? What are some of the things you want to tick off? And we're going to start from macro and go down to micro over the next couple of episodes. We're going to talk a little bit about the things you want to do in your life. We're going to talk about the things you want to do in the next 12 months, even the next 30 days. So let's talk about that big picture. What is it that you want to do in your lifetime? What is it that's important to you that's going to make a difference to you? What are those goals that you've always dreamt about, but you pushed to one side for whatever reason? You didn't think you were worthy or deserving or you were capable or it was possible in your lifetime. So what we'll cover specifically is we'll talk about the power of writing down 100 lifetime goals and how to do that. And before you start flipping out and going, 100, Keith, I can't get 10. I can get you to 100. I can get you to 100. I can guarantee you that. The second thing that we'll talk about is we'll talk about the six areas to think about when you create your list of 100 goals. So what are those six key areas to ponder before you start, actually start writing? I'm going to ask you 25 questions. See, here's what I do know is that if I can ask you 25 questions, I can get you to 100 goals. Because with every one of those questions, you can, uh, you can create four answers. So I'm going to get you to 100 goals really simply. Here's the next thing. We're going to talk about statistics of how many goals will you achieve in the next three years if you follow the process that I want to share with you during this episode. What else will I spend some time with? Why most people never know what they want in their life. Most people just turn up. They become busy being busy. They actually never stop and think about what's important, what matters and what makes a difference. They never get off the treadmill for a little bit. So we'll talk a little bit about how to do that. We'll also talk about what stops people from exploring the possibilities in their life. And the other thing we'll spend some time is why it's criti critical to understand your drivers in life. And we're going to spend more time on this in another episode, but we're going to talk about the drivers that can get you started. So let's talk about writing down your list of 100 goals. Now, if you've read my profile, you'll understand that I am a best-selling author. I've written four best-selling books. I am a professional speaker. I've won a multi-award winning professional speaker. So I've won numerous awards for um, the, the work that I do. Um, you'll also understand that um, I'm highly regarded in my industry. Um, something like about 30% of my 260 clients come and use me. I've used me every year for 10 years. So I have great repeat work with my clients. Uh, I speak all over the world. Uh, so that's all the front end story. And, and I don't say that as a brag. I, I just say that's the front end story. That's not the back story. So let me share with you the back story. I don't know about you, but I was academically challenged going through school. In actual fact, I was hopeless at school. I only went to school to play sport and to hang out with my friends. So at, the, uh, at, at year 10, I decided that I was going to leave school and go and get a job. And I went and got a job with Klaus. Klaus was a six foot four German bricklayer. Klaus spoke very little English, but what he would say to me, what he had mastered in the um, you know, English language was ya more bricks or ya more mud, which means go and get more bricks or go and get more cement. And so here I am, I'm a little guy. I go over and mix up a barrel load of cement, give him the cement. No sooner did I give him the cement that he said, go and get more bricks. I'd go over and load up a wheelbarrow full of bri uh, bricks and bring it over to him. No sooner did I bring those to him, he said, yeah, more mud. And he was a machine. He was relentless. He was a massive man. Just It was like he was chiseled out of concrete. We'd sit down at morning tea time and Klaus, being the true German conversationalist, would say nothing, not a word. 
Then he'd look at his watch and he'd go, yeah, more mud. And so off we'd go to work. You know what? When I worked for Klaus, I worked for him for about six weeks before I learnt my lesson. And the lesson which I've taken throughout my whole business career has been this. Always, always, always do your due diligence. Because what I didn't understand about Klaus when I first started working for him is back in Germany, Klaus held the German record for laying the most amount of bricks in a day. Is this the guy you want to work for as a brickies labourer, doing your bricklayer's apprenticeship? No, you want to work for the slowest guy from Germany. Klaus was this, he was the guy that would be at the end of any job. He was the guy laying the last brick because he was the fastest. So I decided to take the easy road. I went back to school. I went back to school, I repeated year 10, did year 11, got halfway through my year 12. My mum came to me one day and she said, son, you got to get a job. And I said, why, mum? She said, well, look, I, she said, I want to know. She said, she asked me this question. I want to know why I've never seen you read a book. She said, I want to know why I've never seen you do homework. And I want to know why I haven't seen a report card in the last two terms. Well, that question was really easy to answer. I was burning them at the front gate before they got to her. She said, what do you want to do with your life? And of course I said, I don't know. My mum, probably like your mum, like your parents, a true problem solver, she said, I'm going to get you a job. Now my mum had a lot of push in the local council. She was a tea lady there. And she got me a job working in water supply and sewerage. I've got to tell you, it was the graft and corruption at the highest level. I think if you gave her son a job, you got a couple of extra ice vovos and a Tim Tam uh, for, uh, for employing her son. Anyway, I started my working life on the Gold Coast in water supply and sewerage in the bowels of the organisation, so to speak. But I was ambitious, I was motivated, I wanted to get out of sewerage, who wouldn't? And I worked my way up to the prestigious position of noxious weed inspector. Now, you might ask what a noxious weed inspector does on the Gold Coast. Well, in this particular case, what I'd do is I'd go to my desk, I'd pick up a clipboard, a bit like this one, and I'd get uh, uh, keys to a Canary Yellow short wheelbase Toyota Land Cruiser, and I used to travel at 100 kilometres an hour down the Gold Coast Highway looking for noxious weeds. Uh, I didn't find too many. I used to pull up at a place called Panet Bakery, and I'd have a cream butter meat pie and a litre of Coke, and I'd read the paper for an hour. I wasn't that motivated and I was absolutely hopeless at, you know, at the work. I used to go to Burley Beach for my lunch hour, uh, which was more than an hour, and I used to you know, go back to the council chambers at 4.40. Why 4.40? Because if I worked an extra 40 minutes, I got a nine-day fortnight. My boss came to me one day, a guy called Len Anderson. He was the chief health inspector. And he said, Keith, we'd like you to go on a week-long leadership program. And I thought, he's got rocks in his head. I'm sleeping a couple of hours every day. I'm, I'm down the beach during my lunch hour. I'm, the weeds are running rampant in my area. And then he said the magic words, you get a week off work with full pay. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I'm a leader. Maybe I'm a leader. I don't know it. He was involved in Rotary. And um, there's a program called RYLA, Rotary Youth Leadership Award, R. Y L A. It's in 30 years ago it was 18 to 24 year olds. These days it's 18 to 28 year olds, and it's this week long workshop that they take you out in the middle of nowhere, and they teach you about leadership and cooperation and teamwork. They teach you about public speaking. They teach teach you about problem solving, about how to set goals, uh, how to build up your self confidence, self esteem, how to live away from home, how to manage your money. And so for a whole week, there was about 80 of us at this program. And on the last day, a guy stood up and he said, here's what we'd like you to do. He said, we'd like you to grab a clipboard and go and find a shady tree. I thought, I've got this mastered. I can do this. I can do whatever he's going to ask me to do. I can do this because I know how to find a shady tree and I know how to use a clipboard. He said, we'd like you to write down 100 things you want to do in your lifetime. And I thought, how hard can that be? I just had a whole week of people telling me I can be anything do anything, have anything, and achieve anything. So I'm suitably motivated, engaged, enthused, energised. To, I'm ready to attack. I'm ready to write down my list of 100 things. They said, here's what we'd like you to do. We'd like you to go and find a shady tree, take this clipboard, write down 100 things you want to do in your lifetime, and you have 90 minutes to do it. I thought, I can do this. So I started my life to-do list, and I wrote down six things, and I stopped. It was the longest 90 minutes of my life. The seventh thing I wrote down, the seventh thing I wrote down was finish this list. I was looking for anything. It took me six weeks to get to 100. 
but I'm glad to say to you that I have completed my list eight times over. Uh, there are still some goals on the original list. I still haven't gone to England and watched Australia play um, England at Lords in a test match in cricket. Um, I still haven't gone to the West Indies and drunk rum punch under a palm tree. And I still haven't written a New York Times bestselling book. But of the hundred I wrote down, there's only about six that I haven't done. And I've done a whole lot more. I would never, never ever imagine that I'd write, you know, four best-selling books considering I never read one at school. I would never consider that I'd be invited to speak at audiences over 7,000 people and enjoy it. And I never would have thought about having a relationship that I have with my daughters and my wife. But all of those things all were part of a list. And I just believe that it's so critical to write down 100 things. Why 100? Why 100? Because anybody can write down 10. Geez, a dumb, noxious weed inspector can get seven. Anybody can write down 10. But unlike my Ryla program, who just gave us a blank piece of paper and no instructions apart from writing down 100, I've come up with a process. I've come up with a process that I can get you to 100. And why is 100 so magical? It's because you start to dig deeper. You start to bring to the surface things that you've suppressed and you've pushed to one side. And you start to bring that to the forefront of those things that you really, really want to do. And there's a certain degree of magic when you start to pursue your passion and the goals that you want to do in your lifetime. And you feel like you're starting to make momentum and progress to something that's worthwhile, that's important, that matters to you. Let me give you, just for those people in the audience going, it seems very childlike, Keith. Yeah, yeah, it does seem like a childlike activity. But let me give you some statistical analysis. You know, I've been now going back to that Ryler program. So 30 years ago, I went as a participant. I'm going back next year will be my 30th year as a presenter. And so, in actual fact, next year my 18-year-old daughter goes to that program. And it's so advanced now. It's such a great program. It's run all around the country. It's a wonderful thing. Side note, if you've got kids 18 to 30, get them on that program and get them sponsored by Rotary. It's fantastic. But here's what I can tell you. In my own business, we have got people to send their goals to us. And statistically, here's what I can tell you. If you write down 100 goals and send it to me, we put it in the vault. And in the vault, what happens is we put it in that vault and we mark it to send it back to you in three years' time. And here's what I can guarantee will happen to you. Statistically, if you send us your list of 100 goals, I can guarantee... To continue enjoying this presentation, download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today.